to the second keynote speaker of this afternoon, uh, Associate Professor Frances Subaran. She will be talking about preparing teachers and students for emergency online, online teaching, which is currently what we, are, uh, we have been facing in the past uh, two years, but still uh, we should be prepared for next one if in case it happen again. Uh, before she deliver her presentation, let me briefly uh, read uh, her uh, biography. Uh, Professor Frances Sobara has been living and teaching in Japan since 1989, and she's been teaching in higher education for over 20 years. She's currently chair of the Department of English at Kobeshion Women's University in Japan, and for uh, her career, she has also set up and teaches in an international school English program for elementary school school student. She holds a Master of Education in Applied Linguistics from Temple University, Japan, and a doctorate degree of education from the University of Liverpool, uh, United Kingdom. Her main areas of interest are teaching English to young learners, gender equality in higher education, and attitudes to technology in education. Uh, Professor uh, Frances Sobara, will you welcome your presentation? That's lovely. Thank you so much. Can I just check with you, um, uh, Lupidara Sensei? Um, can you hear me okay? You're, uh, we can hear, hear you very well. Oh, good. Okay. Um, because I have to confess that today I'm actually teaching in. Um, the international school so i've just been teaching all day and i've been popping in looking at the presentations and they're really wonderful um i hope that you all hear me well if you hear some noise it might be some children leaving the school because i'm teaching inside the school today um but i'm sure that you can hear me clearly so um i start i'm going to share my slides with you uh, well, actually, before yes, I share my slides, I wanted to say thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I've been to Indonesia a few times. Um, like um, Professor Dickey, I would love to go back there again. I love Indonesian countryside, Indonesian people, Indonesian food. So um, we're just all praying that we can all start traveling and meeting each other um, face to face very soon. So um, I'll start sharing my slides now. All right, just a minute, please. I want to go to screen share. Okay, wait, wait a minute. Right, okay, I hope that you can see my slides okay. So um, yes, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. So my name is Francis Shiobara and I work in Japan at Kobe Shoin Women's University. And um, I wanted to talk today about COVID-19. Now we're all hoping that this pandemic is over soon. And there's a temptation for us to think, okay, that's finished. Okay, let's just um, move on. But I think it's very important for us to reflect on what we've learned from this pandemic. It's been such a unique experience for so many of us. And really two years ago, we never imagined to do this kind of conference. I think two years ago, you would have all been very nervous about joining um, this conference. And I think I would have been nervous about presenting at this conference. So, um, that's what I want to talk to you today about what we've learned and how we can improve the education in our universities from now. So 
First of all, I wanted to share a little bit about myself, just because I think I was in quite a unique situation that I want to share with you. So many of you will have heard I'm British. I come from the United Kingdom, but I've lived in Japan for 32 years. 27 years I've been teaching at higher education in Japan. Um, and so I have a long experience. Um, now, another thing that's quite important for me to share is that I did my doctoral degree, my PhD, fully online. I was living in Japan and I did it with a university in the UK, but I did it online. And what this means is that I had a very unique experience of being an online student before the um, COVID-19 pandemic struck. So I already knew what it was like to study online. When the pandemic struck, I was the chair of the English department at my university. Um, I'm actually the first um, non-Japanese female chair. There was one other um, American chair in the past, but in the entire history of the university, mostly Japanese people were chairs. Um, I'm also the English section head of the Foreign Language Education Center. And this is the center within the university that offers classes to non-English majors. Um, we offer English classes, but we also offer Chinese, Korean and French classes to non-English majors. Unfortunately, no Indonesian. I hope we can have Indonesian in the future. Um, now, another thing that's very important about me is that I have good Japanese skills, but I'm not bilingual. And the reason this is important is because due to the pandemic, so much of what we did was coming through messages being sent. And these were all sent in Japanese. And not only did I have to understand them, but I also had to liaise with um, the part-time teachers who maybe didn't understand some of the messages. So um, let me outline the talk today. So first of all, I want to talk about my location and the students that I was teaching. After that, I want to talk about the ICT situation in Japan before 2020, before the COVID-19 pandemic. Then the main thing I'm going to talk about is the support that my university and my department offered for teachers and students to help them cope with this exceptionally difficult situation. I want to talk about the successes, but of course, more importantly, the mistakes we made, what we shouldn't do next time. And um, the lessons we've learned from the last two years and how this is going to change the future of education after the COVID-19 pandemic. I hope we never have a pandemic like this again, but I feel now, even if we do, we are much more prepared for it. We anticipate what we would do. So, as I said, um, I work at Kobe Shoin Women's University. This is a private Japanese women's university. We have about 3,000 students. Um, I am chair of the English department. In the English department, we have 15 full-time teachers or professors. Eight of them are Japanese, seven of them are non-Japanese. Um, five are English speakers, native English speakers. One is Korean and one is Belgian. We also have 32 part-time teachers who work in the English department. 17 are Japanese, 15 are non-Japanese. These numbers change a little bit um, each year, each semester. There are 500 English majors. Then the Foreign Language Education Center, as I said, um, we teach um, non-English majors and approximately 1,000 non-English majors take um, English classes. Um, every student takes English classes um, twice a week in the first year. Um, in the second year, there's a lot of students that take it. Um, 
And then third and fourth year students can choose foreign languages, including English, um, as elective classes. So the situation in Japan may be coming from Indonesia. Many of you are imagining, oh, Japan, it's very high tech, Panasonic, Fujitsu, um, Sony, these are all Japanese companies. So many people associate Japan with technology, but the reality is that Japan was not really connected to technology, especially for education. Um, our academic year starts in April. So in April, 2020, it was just at the beginning of the pandemic. And most universities delayed the start of their academic year because they were not prepared. So this survey was carried out in July. And as of July the 1st, um, this is from the Ministry of Education in Japan, all universities started their spring semester. 83.8% of class universities were offering classes conducting distance learning classes in some way. I was quite surprised by this number 83.8 because I wondered this 16% really, they weren't doing any distance learning. It was amazing to me. But as you can see, the Japan has a number of different universities, national universities, public universities, private universities where I work and colleges of technology. You can see the colleges of technology in-person classes. This is students coming to the university were 33.3%. So about one third of the classes were fully in-person. This is because colleges of technology tend to be vocational schools. So a lot of those classes cannot be taught online if you are qualifying to become a mechanic or a hairdresser or a nail artist, you cannot do this um, online for many of the classes. So they have far more face-to-face -face classes. National University, you can see, have the lowest number of face-to-face um, -face classes. So um, the distance learning classes, the column on the side. Now, these are classes that are 100% distance learning. And my university, although it says 22.7% here, my university was in fact 100% at the beginning of the pandemic. All classes and in the English department and um, the foreign language education section, all language classes were offered for one year, totally distance learning classes. So this was the situation of the classes that we needed to offer. But this is the situation. Now, this was a survey carried out um, by the OECD in 2019. So just before the pandemic, this was asking Japanese teachers how prepared they were to use ICT. And if we go from the bottom of the chart, you can see teachers who frequently use ICT in Japan was about 18%, less than 20% of teachers frequently used ICT in their classes. This doesn't mean online teaching. This just means teachers who are frequently using a computer in their class. Please think about that. 18%, less than 20% of teachers frequently used a computer in their class in 2019. And in 2020, these teachers had to teach everything using ICT. You can see the OECD average was over 50% teachers frequently using ICT. But on the other hand, teachers with formal ICT training well, in Japan, it's 60%. That's because it was some of the older teachers had not taken classes in ICT when they were training to become teachers. Um, so the number of teachers who received ICT training was higher in Japan than in the OECD in general. 
teachers requesting ICT training in Japan before the COVID-19 pandemic were about 18%. I think we can say it is no coincidence that teachers requesting ICT training and teachers frequently using ICT is almost the same number. And although, of course, we don't know for sure, I would guess that many of the teachers who were using ICT said they wanted more training, but many of the other teachers just ignored it. They thought, I'm a teacher, I go to the classroom, I have a textbook, I don't need ICT. Um, you can also see teachers who learned ICT in recent professional development. Although OECD numbers are a bit higher than Japan, still over 50% of teachers had received recent professional development. However, despite 60% having formal ICT training, over 50% had received professional development, only about 35% felt prepared to use ICT. So I came to this pandemic with only 60, with only 35% of teachers prepared to use ICT and 65% who said they were not prepared to use ICT. So this is very different than what your image might be of Japan and very different from other countries. For example, Australia has been using a lot of ICT for many years, doing online classes, um, hybrid classes, many things like that. Japan was just not doing that. So these are some quotes from teachers. So. What Suzuki Nikeda found in 2020, this was in May of 2020, right at the start of the pandemic. They said very few universities had remote courses before the coronavirus crisis. Due to strict regulations on staff postings and instruction methods, meaning most lecturers and students had little or no experience of conducting online classes. So although I took my PhD in the UK fully online, Japan offers almost no um, degrees fully online, even for master's degrees or PhDs. And these are some quotes from teachers. One teacher said, university teachers can't just become YouTubers. This was the first thing. So initially teachers were just saying, no, we can't do this. And a lot of teachers called for the Ministry of Education to close the universities for six months. At that time, we didn't know how long the crisis would continue. Um, another teacher said preparation time has gone up fivefold compared to regular classes. I think that this is very, very true. This was what I heard from other teachers over and over again. It was my experience, and probably you all have had a similar experience. The amount of preparation that we put in to trying to get these classes online was enormous. Um, added to this, adjunct instructors, so this means part-time teachers, um, often work at many different universities. So they're using different kinds of LMS. So these are three of the most common LMS. I'm not sure which kind of LMS you're using mostly in Indonesia. Uh, Google Classroom is very popular in Japan. Moodle is also very popular and Manaba. You might not have heard of Manaba because this is a Japanese LMS. And this is in fact the LMS that my university used. Um, but if you imagine the part-time teachers who are working in my university, my department, one day a week, and the other days they're using Google Classroom, Moodle, they might be using Manaba, but a different version of Manaba. So these teachers, not only are they having to learn LMS, learn to teach online, but they have to learn a different system every day of the week. Also Zoom that we're using now that we all think is amazing now. I had not even heard of Zoom two years ago. Microsoft Teams, my university pays for Microsoft Teams, but it gives us an option of using Zoom or Teams. So teachers 
were being asked to learn all kinds of new software. And um, I think it was very, very challenging. Now, added to this challenge, how about the students? How prepared were the students? So this is data that I have gathered for access to a computer that students can use for schoolwork and link to the university and link to the internet. So in Japan in 2003, only about 40% of students had computers, but 2006, just two years later, it jumped up nearly 60%. 2009, it jumped up to about 65, nearly 70%. 2018, before the pandemic, the number had dropped down to under 60%. You might be asking, why did the number go down? And I think probably this is because between 2009 and 2018, um, smartphones became so hugely popular. And because they have such capability that many people thought, mm, I don't need a computer anymore. I'll just use my phone. You can surf the internet on the phone. You can send emails. You can do everything you need to. I have to tell you, I once had a student write her graduation thesis on an iPhone. So it was, I didn't recommend it. And I kept on begging her to use the university computers, but she said, no, no, I prefer my phone. I'm quicker on my phone. So that's what she did and she managed to do it somehow. Um, I also got numbers for Indonesia. Now we can see the numbers in Indonesia are much lower than Japan. So Indonesia has a different struggle. And I think it must have been very, very challenging in Indonesia for students. And um, I heard earlier on today, I was listening very interestingly um, to the presentation about teaching students in rural areas. Um, and maybe in Indonesia, students in um, urban areas have more access to computers, but in rural areas, maybe they don't have access to computers. And that makes it so much more difficult for those students. I also added some data from Hong Kong because they have one of the highest levels of um, computer access for students. And their pattern is higher than Japan, but very similar pattern that it went down from 2009 to 2018. And again, I think um, the Chinese people love using their smartphones. So this is probably the reason. So anyway, we went from this situation. So the pandemic started and then maybe in Japan, under 60% of students had access to a computer. And suddenly we said to them, okay, we want you to stay at home and to do all of your schoolwork on a computer. So this was the situation that I was faced with. Basically, we had teachers without technical skills, we had students without access to computers at home, and we had an administration not set up for online learning with no experience of offering online learning classes. And now I've called this emergency remote learning teaching because many um, programs that have been offering online programs for many years disliked calling the types of programs we were offering that we put together in a few weeks um, distance learning because they said it's not it's not the full quality it's just emergency remote teaching so what I want to share with you now is what I did as head of my department and head of the English section so what solutions did I offer? So the first thing was I offered simplified access. This was for teachers and for students. We set it up so that everyone had the same ID and password for the university Wi-Fi, the LMS, the intranet, everything in the university used the same ID and password. And this was very, very important. And if anybody is setting up their 
university or you're introducing a new kind of software or a new LMS, I would definitely recommend try to use the same ID and password for all of the different aspects because students get confused and lose their passwords and all kinds of things. Um, this really helped us a lot. Um, also, we made manuals in English and Japanese, although it's a Japanese university, because the Japanese language, especially the written language is so difficult, um, many of the non-Japanese teachers could not understand the manuals that were written in Japanese. So we made them in English as well. We made a lot of instructions in English. Also, a lot of the messages that were being sent by the university president, that's equivalent to your rector, to all of the teachers and students, I translated those messages into English and sent it to the teachers to ensure that teachers understood what they needed to do when they were starting teaching, the rules for teaching. Um, I wanted to make sure that no teachers slipped through the net and didn't do things just because they were confused. The next thing that we did, we offered initial workshops on campus for teachers. These were done in Japanese. A few of the non-Japanese teachers came, but actually very few teachers came to these initial workshops. I would say the majority of teachers did not know how to use the LMS and did not know how to use Zoom, but they did not come to the campus because at this time, it was March, 2020, everyone was terrified. They were terrified of the virus. They didn't want to get on trains. They didn't want to be in a room learning. So after those initial workshops on campus, I then started offering workshops in English on Zoom. And I would have to say in the future that I would just say, forget about the on-campus workshops because offering workshops, how to use LMS, on Zoom worked very, very well. And especially when we gathered teachers in small groups, it was really wonderful. And they asked a lot of questions. We allowed them to share their screen. They had chances to use the LMS and show us. And I could be saying, no, 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 click the button at the top. And this was really helpful. So if you are in a position that you need to teach new teachers, um, how to use software or LMS, or you have a new LMS you want to teach teachers, I would definitely recommend use Zoom to do it. It works very, very well. Um, the full-time staff tried to make as many materials and quizzes as possible for the part-time teachers, because although the part-time teachers were learning to use the LMS, there were some difficult things making quizzes and things like that. So we did try to encourage the full-time teachers to do it. Unfortunately, some of the full-time teachers were really struggling themselves. So they couldn't do that so much. Now, the university had a problem because teachers want freedom to teach. But universities want to ensure an educational quality control. And in fact, we heard um, Professor Dickey speaking earlier about ethics, and he talked about teachers having ethics, and teachers do have ethics. And because of that, they like to have their own policies. Um, and so they want to control the teaching style, they want to have some control over their students, and they want to have control over technology, what technology they use, how much technology they use. And um, this was very difficult during the pandemic because universities wanted to ensure educational quality and goals. It was an exceptional time, however, the Ministry of Education still had requirements of the universities, what you have to do as a university to keep accreditation. The university had graduation requirements, what students need to do 
to graduate, we have rules in the university which couldn't be disregarded. Students have to take a certain number of classes in each semester. They have to take a certain number of courses. They have to pass a certain number of courses. So we couldn't just start canceling courses or canceling classes because this was necessary. And the other thing was that we need to ensure fairness for all students. And Professor Dickey, I think a lot of his ethics, I couldn't hear the whole of his presentation I was working, but the idea of ethics relates to fairness as well. So what support did we give for students? So the first thing we did for students was we offered initial workshops in the university on campus. Now this was very well attended. Although teachers didn't come, students did. I think they were desperate to come to university, meet their friends, to learn about what they had to do. And it was wonderful. We had an entire week of holding these workshops. We got small groups of students in, in the morning, in the afternoon. We kept them for about one hour and then sent them home again. So we never had huge numbers in the university at the same time. And we managed to get students set up in general on their phones, um, so that they knew what they were doing. Um, also in my department, I put all the full-time teachers in charge of a certain group of students and they were asked to contact those students by email or whatever way they could to check if they knew how to use the LMS and if they knew what they were doing. And they did that. In my department of about 500 students, there was only about 20 students we didn't manage to contact. And my department assistant, she managed to contact those students. In fact, I have to say she was amazing. She, um, she took the student lists home with her and she just kept on phoning people at home on their mobile phones at night, just trying to get in touch with them. And she managed to contact everyone. And I think that this was important because you might think, well, just 20 students, we couldn't contact them, but maybe those are the 20 students who are struggling. And because of that, it's very important that in this situation, we don't get most of the students or nearly all of the students, we contacted every student and that was essential. Um, the other thing was, we sent out a survey to the students through the LMS system, asking them about their ICT capabilities. Can you use a computer? Do you have a computer? Do you have Wi-Fi at home? Things like that. Um, we made videos explaining students how to use the LMS and um, Zoom and things like that. Um, we made the videos very simply in Japanese for students. We uploaded them onto the website, the university website, so that students could watch them. They had come to the initial setup, but of course you forget things, you forget what you're doing. So we managed to um, share that as well. Now, um, research from um, the OECD shows that around the world, different universities in different countries try to offer short-term support measures. And some of the short-term support measures that were offered were a supply of digital devices, especially laptop computers were lent out in some countries, some universities. Financial support was given to students and schools in some situations and funds for safety and cleaning was um, given. Now the Ministry of Education in Japan did supply extra money to try to support um, schools. Most of this money actually didn't go to universities, especially private universities. Um, but what my university did provide, it provided facilities on campus to use Wi-Fi or hardware. So we didn't lend students laptop computers. We did not have enough laptop computers to lend. But we did have computer labs at the university, so we offered students to come to the university to use those computers. We had staff on hand who disinfected the computers every time after a student had used them. Um, in fact, only a few students used that, 
But one thing that did work well, we set up the big lecture halls. We bought lots and lots of um, extension cords for students to plug in. And we had a very powerful Wi-Fi. So many students didn't have good Wi-Fi at home, but they came to the university and used the university Wi-Fi with their own laptop. And this seemed to be very helpful and students liked it. Also, as the university opened up a little bit, many students came to university, for example, they might have a first period class, which was a practical class. For example, um, we have a nutrition department, so they take cooking lessons. So maybe the first period was a cooking lesson, but the second period was an English class. So um, they would go to the lecture hall and they would take an online class inside the university. We gave all students headsets. So these were headsets with speakers. This was a complete waste of money and we shouldn't have done it because I can honestly say, I have never seen any of my students using these headsets. <laughs> I think students, they either use little earbuds, trendy little earbuds or not at all. They were just using, as I am now, just using the speaker on my um, laptop computer. So the headsets, sadly, they were quite good quality and the university bought them and the students didn't use them. So that was unfortunate. Um, we also gave financial support to every student so that they could buy hardware, for example, a Chromebook or a laptop or they could install Wi-Fi in their home. Now, in Indonesia, you might be amazed by this. Every student in my university was given the equivalent of about $500 to help them um, get um, equipment or Wi-Fi. And um, I think students really, really appreciated that. Um, Teachers and students were all provided with Microsoft Office and OneDrive, which is a cloud saving device um, by the university. Um, it, this was really good because it meant that as a teacher, I could ask my students to make a PowerPoint presentation and I knew everybody had access to PowerPoint. They didn't have to buy, it's quite expensive by Microsoft Office, all students had it. They all had um, Microsoft Word. And also the students didn't need to use their own computer. They had OneDrive that they could save things. Teachers also, it was really useful for us to be able to collect um, students' presentations. They would make presentation recordings and they would upload them into OneDrive. And this worked very, very well. And I could grade their presentations um, it would have been too much data really going straight into the LMS system or going onto my own computer. Um, the last thing was we set up a really nice technology support center in the university. Students could go uh, to Saturday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., and they could ask anything, how to use the LMS, they could ask for advice if their computer was broken, anything. And it was almost never used. We employed two full-time staff to work in this center. We worried at the beginning that two staff weren't enough and they had nothing to do. It was very sad. I think the reality is that most students now, if they have a problem, they either go on Google or they ask their friends. They just don't tend to go to a support center. They could even telephone the support center, but they didn't. So what can I say are the successes? So I would say the successes in my university, the LMS was very stable considering it was hardly used before the pandemic and then every single class in the university suddenly on one day started using the LMS and it never broke down. Um, I think in the entire two years we've had so far, um, approximately 30 minutes, the internet went down at our university. We got it fixed within um, two minutes, within 30 minutes, but that was quite amazing. 
students exceeded expectations in using ICT and software. I was just amazed and so proud of them that they came in with very little knowledge and they did it. Most teachers were able to adapt to online teaching. They thought they couldn't, they said, we are not YouTubers. They said, this is causing us five times as much work, but they did it. And the end of semester course evaluations in universities in Japan, we must give course evaluations, all students fill in a questionnaire. The evaluations were very similar face-to-face -face and online classes. We also held various online events. We have a conversation lounge that students can go to at any time, Monday to Friday, just to chat with um, a native English speaker in English. And we managed to set this up. I'm sorry, there's a spelling mistake there on joined. I'm very sorry, I just noticed it now. Um, this is not how you spell joined. <laughs> students joined through Zoom. And they really enjoyed chatting with native speakers. I think also psychologically and mentally, it was lovely for students that they could go somewhere and just chat because many students were at home and were feeling very lonely. In December, the this morning, a little bit to um, Lindsay Heron talking about her um, classes and task based and the poster presentation because students could go in and they could write comments and they could look at all the posters. It really was wonderful. In the past, we would have the posters all up in a big um, hall and people walked around looking at the posters, but having them online was wonderful. Um, now, unfortunately, there were mental health issues. Um, in July of 2020, 44.7% of Japanese university students said they did not find their lives fulfilling. And they cited online classes as one reason. And this is very sad. Um, student counseling at my university was really working around the clock. Many students needed support. This was provided face-to-face. -face. Students came to the university and had face-to-face counseling. It was also provided online and on the telephone. My university is very lucky. We have a psychology department and we actually train students to become counselors and therapists. And a lot of the professors who were working in that department actually stepped up and offered counseling um, to students. And this was really important. And I think if a pandemic happens again, we need to think about mental health issues. We need to think about how we support students in this situation. Um, Zoom fatigue. We've all heard about it. Um, Ramachandran from Stanford University did a lot of research on this. And findings were that Zoom fatigue is real. It's not the same giving a face-to-face -face lecture as giving an online lecture. Excessive amounts of close-up eye contact is intense. Um, seeing yourself during video lessons in real time is fatiguing. Video lessons reduce our mobility. So teachers sitting down in the seat, usually when you're lecturing, you're standing up, you're walking around, you move backwards and forwards. But when you're giving lectures, you're just sitting. This is exhausting for the teacher. It's also exhausting for students if they're taking too many Zoom classes. And the cognitive load in Zoom classes is much higher. So this Zoom fatigue, I recommended to my teachers that even though we have 90 minute classes, that they should not be using Zoom for 90 minutes. I said to them, you know, please maximum 60 minutes and then 30 minutes with the students doing other asynchronous activities. 
there were some teachers who felt they really wanted to be with the students on Zoom for the full 90 minutes. The reality is if students have four classes in a day, they could be on Zoom for six hours a day. This was not a good situation. Now, mistakes we made. Well, I hope you like this picture that I shared with you. And this is from the internet. But the first mistake we made was I sort of assumed that after I'd offered a workshop at the beginning of the semester that teachers knew what they were doing and that they would be practicing and learning. And in the middle of the semester, I suddenly discovered that there were teachers who didn't know what they were doing. And I had to jump in and I had to offer more workshops. And we've rectified that now. And we now have workshops once a month offering teachers. We have a theme for the workshop, but also teachers can ask questions. This is all done through and it seems to be working very well. Another mistake I made in the English department was I gave teachers a free reign to use alternative software and websites. So some textbooks had online workbooks that teachers set students up with um, that have their separate LMS built in. Um, some teachers had students um, using things like TED Educational, which is a wonderful, wonderful resource. Some teachers had students doing Flipgrid, which is also wonderful. However, students just got overwhelmed. They said, wow, we're just learning to use the university LMS. We're learning how to use Zoom. We're learning all of these things. And now we've got to learn these other software as well. Um, some students coped well, but some students didn't. And they actually made formal complaints that the university was asking them to do this. So from the second year on, I said to teachers, please only use things within our university LMS, which was unfortunate, but I think we need to do that. Um, the last thing was, it's connected to assuming that teachers could use it. We didn't offer enough ongoing support for adjunct lecturers. I think um, I set them up and then they were teaching and I talked about uh, mental health issues for students, but I think teachers were also suffering from mental health issues. And I think I should have been chatting to teachers, like I would normally chat to teachers in the um, you know, teacher's lounge. I should have actually been contacting teachers and chatting to them much more. And that was a big mistake that I made. Um, that I didn't support the teachers enough. And I do regret that now. Um, the final one is hybrid and classroom mix. And we are still doing this now. And I just don't think it works. We have some students come to the university, but some students have submitted applications that they cannot come to the university. Maybe they have a health issue. Maybe someone in their family has a health issue that puts them at high risk. Um, so some classes I'm teaching the classroom, but also I have Zoom going, I'm trying to teach them on Zoom. Um, and as you can see from um, this meme, it's just too difficult. It doesn't seem to work. So I think if students cannot come to the classroom, probably they should be offered an asynchronous alternative rather than trying to do Zoom while you're teaching students face to face. Surprises. So students rose to the challenge. That was the most wonderful surprise. Students and teachers were adaptable. Um, another thing that Singh found in the Japan Times was that shy students participated more actively in asynchronous activities such as discussion forums than real-time classrooms. And teachers discovered that some activities worked better online than in the classroom. So from now, they're going to use that. So this is a professor, if you remember at the beginning, the professor's saying, you know, we can't become YouTubers. Then this teacher from Sophia University in Tokyo said, a lot of us doubted it and expected to have our worst semesters online. I had a great semester. We all came out of this with a new skill set. And I hope that all of you are feeling this now, that we have come out of this with a new skill set. 
we can be online teachers. So the ongoing lessons learned into university collaboration is much easier online. So we can do a lot of innovative things online, like this type of conference. Students prepared for flipped classrooms, doing reading, etc., outside the class. So having asynchronous activities um, worked very well for students and just doing, for example, um, 60 minutes Zoom. Short video lectures can be given very effectively outside class. Um, I don't think long lectures work very well outside class. There's a lot of evidence to show that students don't watch a one hour lecture. But if you do a 10 minute lecture, they might watch it. Um, and teachers need ongoing training every semester to keep up to date with technology. So Andreas Schlecker from um, the OECD, he's Director of Education and Skills at OECD, he says that students from privileged backgrounds supported by their parents and eager and able to learn could find their way past closed doors to alternative learning opportunities. Those from disadvantaged backgrounds often remain shut out when the schools shut down. Now we heard this morning about students in rural areas of Indonesia that we need to consider and also students who don't have access to Wi-Fi or things like that need to be provided with support. Students whose parents are helping them, their parents set up the Wi-Fi, their parents buy them a computer, found ways to learn. So into the future, I think online is not a replacement for face-to-face, -face, but it is an excellent resource and some things that we do can be offered better online. The majority of students and teachers prefer face-to-face -face classes, okay? Occasionally I hear people say, oh, I think students like online. In fact, um, a lot of research has been done and the majority of students and teachers prefer face-to-face -face classes. Teachers and students are highly adaptable. We should never be afraid to try new things, start new teaching methodologies, anything, because now we know Teachers and students can do it if you set them the challenge. Online learning improves peer assessment and inquiry-based learning. Um, and I think that's what we learned from um, Lindsay Heron's um, presentation this morning, um, that it can really improve. And flipped learning, flipped classrooms, Lead to led to improved learning in many cases. So these are a few of the references that I used in preparing this presentation. Um, a lot of it came from my own experience and I hope that I can write up um, more and more about this experience. Um, but this will be shared with you. So please check out some of these statistics. Um, now, thank you for listening. Um, gosh, um, I can see there are 42 <laughs> questions. Um, if you haven't noted it down, please note down quickly. This is my email address. I'm very happy to get um, emails from you from now onwards. If any of you would like to come to Japan and study Japanese, um, my university has an excellent um, Japanese language department that teaches students. Um, we've had students. Indonesian students in the past. At the moment, we've got Vietnamese students, Chinese, um, Korean students. So um, I'm very happy. So now I think I will stop my screen share and go back to the main um, section. So um, uh, Professor uh, Rupidara, um, maybe you have some questions for me? Um, good afternoon, Indonesian time. My name is Rizky Junior Uli, and I have the privilege, I got the privilege to lead the question and answer sessions. Oh, and, yes, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, let's jump to the uh, presentations. I have compiled several questions with me and share the screen right now. 
Okay, I hope you can see my screen. And the I first can. question um, comes from Mr. Juanito Rifando and the questions um, goes like this and I quote, in 2003, 2006 and 2009, Students who could use computers were very low, but in 2018, there was a very drastic increase, even though it was not the same as other countries, but the level of computer use was quite high. My question is, what makes the rate of use, uh, rate of use increase rapidly? Are there certain factors that influence this? Thank you. Um, yes, well, I think I think this is referring to Indonesia, maybe, because the numbers actually went down a little bit in um, Japan and in Hong Kong. But the reason is just that more and more people, um, the price of computers has gone down. So nowadays, between 2009, 2018, you can buy very cheap, you know, laptop computers, Chromebooks, this is one reason. And because so much is online now, although education not so much, if we want to go shopping, all kinds of things, we need a computer so more and more people realize. And some people are supplementing television, for example, they think, well, I'll just buy a computer and I will watch Netflix and things like that on the computer. Gaming, of course, is increasing. So. I think, um, yeah, this is um, quite a natural process. Um, the thing that surprised me was not that the computers increased, but that actually in Japan and Hong Kong, the numbers went down between 2009, 2018. That was really a little bit shocking for me. I hope that answers the question well enough. Thank you so much. That certainly answered the questions. And we have the second questions comes from um, Ms. Sandri P. Chahimo, and the question goes like this. Dear Francis, do you think educational quality control is such an appropriate policy applied by the university? What's the potential effect does it have on both students and lecturers based on your experience? Well, thank first you. of all, well, Sandri, I want to say hi and um, thank you. And I hope that we meet each other very soon. Um, so um, do you think educational quality control is such an appropriate policy applied mm. by the university? I think, yes, I think it is necessary that even though this was an exceptional situation, we still have to keep educational quality control. We can't allow the university level just to suddenly drop. Students who graduate from university in 2021, 2022, must still have had a quality education. They must have been provided with that for, in order for them to get a graduation certificate. And we can't have people going out into society or businesses who have not had that level. Um, and the potential effect it has, um, I think it had a good effect. It meant, I think there were some teachers who thought, oh, this is COVID-19, um, I, I just forget about it. I'm not going to ask very much of students. And we did hear with um, Professor Dickey talking about being hard on students. And although there were mental health issues, I think we all need pull the students up and say to them, you know, even though we're in COVID-19, you need to write quality essays. You need to do the reading you're asked to do, even though you're at home in your pajamas, which many of my students were, we're still expecting you to study. So um, that's a great question, but I think the answer to that is yes. And I think having quality controls pull teachers and students up. Okay, sorry, um, Rizki, can you go on to the next question? Thank you so much, um, ma'am. Now, the next question yes. comes from uh, Maria Gracia, and the question is, Dear Francis, do you know any Japanese government's policy that ensure all students from marginalized area or people with disability to get quality education during pandemic? Or at least at your university? Thank you. Right. Um, 
I do not know of any government policies. I think the government, the Ministry of Education was sort of overwhelmed that it didn't have that. But within my university, yes, we um, because we have um, a student support sector. So actually we had a lot of information about students with disabilities and different aspects that every single teacher who taught that student, um, there are students with visual um, disabilities, some students with hearing disabilities could be very difficult and the teachers were contacted and the teachers tried to provide the students. For example, if a student um, had hearing disabilities, then we tried to provide them with a transcript of the listening um, prior to the class, or the teachers would give separate assignments to them that they didn't have to watch a video. Um, they would be given a written task that they had to do. So um, within our university, yes, and students contacted the university to say that they had problems. Now, one of the things um, students from marginalized areas, you might imagine in Japan, it's a very rich country, but some of our students came from rural areas and they did not have um, access to Wi-Fi sometimes, or the Wi-Fi did not work well, it wasn't reliable. When it was raining, the Wi-Fi didn't work. When it was windy, typhoons in Japan, um, and there were problems with that. Some regions had flooding. So all we could do was understand the students were having that problems and try to not penalize them, offer opportunities for them to study in a different way without lowering the expectations saying, well, you don't have to do anything because you're from a marginalized area. So we say you don't have to attend Zoom, but you have to submit the written assignment. So um, that's what we did, but I don't think the government did very much to support those students. Thank you so much for uh, thank you so much for the answer. Uh, I think you're giving us the whole new ideas about the preparing teachers and students for emergency remote area. Now we have come to end of our today's sessions, and thank you so much for uh, let me do the takeover of this Q and A sessions. Now I will give back this opportunity to Miss Linda to continue and proceed to the next session. Lovely. Thank you very, very much.